In most physics problems, we ignore the force of air resistance, sometimes because maybe that force is so small compared to the other forces that the impact it has on the values we get would only affect their value by maybe a fraction of a percent. But maybe you do want to figure it out. Maybe you're doing something where the force of air resistance is large, or you really need to be precise to, say, a tenth of a percent. How would you ever handle air resistance? Well, let's think about what the force of air resistance is going to depend on. So imagine we drop an apple through the air. The apple is going to be hitting these air molecules, impacting them. There's going to be collisions. It's going to be pushing air out of the way. There's going to be viscous forces. This air is going to have to move around the sides of the apple. Maybe it's interacting with bumps on the skin of the apple. There's lots of things the air resistance could depend on. Let's try to list them. So first of all, if this apple falls downward, there's going to be a force of resistance, i.e. a force of air resistance upward. But if we throw the apple upward, let's say we take this apple and we chuck it in the air and it's moving upward, then the air resistance is going to be pointing downward. So the air resistance is always going to be opposed to the direction of the velocity. If the velocity of this apple is up, air resistance is down. And if the velocity of this apple is down, the air resistance is going to be up. So let's say this apple is falling downward. What's one thing that this force of air resistance might depend on? Well, one thing that's hopefully kind of obvious is that the density of the fluid through which the object moves is going to have an impact on the amount of drag force there is. So instead of calling this air resistance, maybe we're not falling through the air. Maybe we drop the apple through some fluid. That's going, to that's going to change how much this drag force is. So instead of just calling it air resistance, we could be more general and we can call it the drag force. What might this drag force depend on? Well, the density of the fluid. The greater the density, the harder it is to move through it. So imagine walking through a pool of water. That's a whole lot harder to do than walking through the air because that pool is much more dense. You're having to push much more mass out of the way as you move. There's going to be a greater drag force. So let's incorporate that in our equation for the drag force. Let's say the density of our fluid is rho. The greater the density, the greater the drag force, and it turns out it's just proportional. So double the density, you should get double the drag force, all else factors being equal. What's something else that this drag force is going to depend on? Well, the cross-sectional area of this apple moving through the air. So imagine the the tube of air that this apple is moving out of the way as it falls down. So take this Take this cross-sectional area of the apple right here. That's what's pushing the air out of the way. So this area here, this cross-sectional area, if that gets bigger, the area is going to have to be pushing more of this air out of the way or more of the fluid out of the way. So if you had an apple, some weird genetically modified apple that was like this wide and super flat, well, it's pushing more air out of the way. There's more collisions per second as this apple is falling there's more collisions because of the larger area, you'd get more drag force. So in other words, a parachute, you want your parachute to be really big, a big area, because you want a lot of drag force when you're falling through the air with a parachute, you want it to make it so you don't move as fast. If your parachute was only this big, uh, you'd be in trouble. So bigger area means bigger drag force, and it's approximately also proportional. So if you double not the total area, but this cross-sectional area. You double the drag force. What's something else this drag force will depend on? Well, something else it depends on is just the surface texture of the object. So if this object has bumps all over it, maybe instead of a nice smooth apple, you had some weird, again, genetically modified apple. I wouldn't want to eat this thing. It's got bumps all over it or divots. Think of it like a golf ball. Golf ball has divots all over it. Now, if this apple falls through the air, it's going to be harder for the air to move around the apple. There's going to be more drag for a surface that resists the flow of fluid over it than there would be for a nice smooth surface that allows the fluid to flow easily over it. We incorporate this information of the texture of the surface in something called the drag coefficient. So oftentimes, this drag coefficient is represented with a C and then a D. So this is the drag coefficient right here. And it also incorporates one other piece of information, not just the surface texture, but the shape of the object. So two objects that have the same cross-sectional area might have different drag forces because of the contour of the object. So an apple shaped like this with this cross-sectional area would be different from, okay, here we go, another weird apple. Imagine a genetically modified apple that had the same cross-sectional area but this apple is shaped exactly like a tube. So this side would go straight up, and this side goes straight up. 
and you get another shape right here. Somehow you make an apple that's shaped exactly like a cylinder. This is gonna have different drag on it compared to this apple that starts here and then contours back. Or if you like, imagine this side of the object's exactly the same, but instead of going straight back, maybe it all contours to a point. You drop these two objects through the air, even though they have the same cross-sectional area, right? The area of the air they're pushing out of the way is the same. They will not have the same drag force on them. These will have different amounts of drag force. And that information also gets incorporated in this drag coefficient. So not only is the drag coefficient the surface texture, it has to do with the contour shape of the object. This is why cars like to do like this on the back because they're more aerodynamic than just some big bulky cylinder or block moving through the air. Sometimes you see on the back of semi trucks too now, they realize this. On the back of a semi truck, they'll apply something like this, makes it more aerodynamic, it's cutting through the same air. We didn't do anything to the front of the semi. All we did was change the form of the back of the semi and that still impacts the amount of drag force and that gets incorporated in this drag coefficient. And it's gonna depend on one more thing. We said if this object moves faster, the faster it moves, the more impacts there's gonna be. So the larger the speed of the object, the greater the drag force. But think about it, it's not just gonna be proportional to the speed. It's gonna be proportional to the speed squared, and this might sound strange. Why speed squared? Why not just speed? The reason it's speed squared, roughly, you can think about it like this. The faster it moves, the more impacts there's gonna be per second. But each one of those collisions is going to be more impactful because the faster you're moving, the more force there's gonna be for each impact. Or in other words, the momentum transfer for each collision is gonna be greater, and there's gonna be more collisions so the drag force doesn't just depend on the speed, it depends on the speed squared. So this admittedly was not a derivation. We just motivated what this drag force might depend on and showed you how it depends on those things. Hopefully that makes sense. The derivation is kind of intense, so I'm not gonna reproduce that here. Just so you know, within that derivation, you get a factor of one half that is often written out here. So you'll often see a factor of one half that's left out here when you look this up in books or online. You might be like, why didn't they just incorporate that within this coefficient here? You could have just absorbed that into there. I don't know why they didn't do it. They didn't do it. You often see the one half written out there when you look this up. So here's a formula. This is a formula for the force of air resistance or the drag force of any object moving through another fluid. But this formula is kind of a pain. For one reason, it's dependent on the speed squared. What that means is, look at this row is a positive value. Density is constant, area is constant, this drag coefficient is going to be constant. Speed squared, even if you're moving down with a negative velocity, you'll square it, you'll get a positive value. So what this formula is really giving you isn't the force as a vector, including the sign. It's really just giving you the magnitude of the drag force. So I'm going to put absolute values here, an absolute value sign, so that we know really we're always going to get a positive number out of this. It's up to us to determine whether this should be positive or negative, depending on whether that air resistance points up or down, right or left. So if you choose up as positive and you've thrown an object upward, it would have air resistance downward. In other words, we'd have to supply a negative to this expression in our formulas to make sure it's pointing in the right direction. So this is only giving you the magnitude. This gives you the magnitude of the drag force right here. That's what this expression tells you. That's one reason it's kind of a pain. You have to think about which direction it goes, add a negative sign. But there's a much bigger reason why this formula is a pain, and that's this speed squared. That might not seem like too big of a deal, but it is a big deal. It makes the problems that you try to solve with this much harder to do. It makes the calculus you try to solve with this a lot harder to deal with. Because of this speed squared, uh, this formula is kind of a uh, drag. Sorry, no pun intended. Actually, yeah, a little bit of pun intended. So you often don't deal with this straight out. If this force was dependent on velocity, it'd be a lot easier to deal with. In fact, if we had a formula that we could write like this, which you often see in books, you'll often see the drag formula written like this. Force of drag is equal to a constant, which we often write B. Why did they choose B as this constant? I don't know, they just chose B, I, I really don't know. It's a backwards D, D like drag, maybe? I don't know, possibly, times just the velocity. You'll often see the drag force written like this, and you might be like, what? It's gotta be one or the other. Drag force is either proportional to the speed squared, or it's proportional to the speed. It can't be proportional to both, right? Well, kind of, 
Why? Because this is this is more exact of a formula. This formula is more exact than the one over here. This is an approximation. This is a pretty good approximation if you're moving at slow speeds and there's basically no turbulence whatsoever. Then it turns out this formula isn't too bad of a formula for the drag force. And it's better than this more exact formula for two reasons. For one, it's proportional to only velocity and not velocity squared. That might not sound like a big deal to you now, but when you go and get into the nitty gritty of the calculations, you realize that this, this is much nicer to deal with than V squared. And the second reason it's better is that this more exact formula is just giving you the magnitude of that drag force. But over here, if I simply add a negative sign, what this formula does, since this isn't velocity squared, it's just velocity, this formula says that the drag force is always gonna be equal to the opposite direction of the vector b times v. b is always a positive constant. So what this says is that this negative is always gonna make it so your drag force is in the opposite direction of the velocity. In other words, if this apple's moving downward, it'll have a negative velocity, assuming we treat up as positive. So if I take that negative velocity of the apple falling down, that negative value multiplied by this negative will give us a positive drag force, and that's what we have. The air resistance is positive because it opposes the direction of the velocity. Or imagine we throw the apple upward. So now the apple has a positive velocity. Why take that positive velocity, multiply by a negative number, that gives me a negative drag force. What does that mean? It means the drag force is down, i.e. opposite direction to the velocity. So this formula is cool. It's cool because it's only V and it's not giving us just the magnitude of, it gives us the magnitude and the direction of that drag force. We get the sign for free as long as we leave this negative here because this negative is saying that this drag force is in the opposite, this negative means opposite, direction to this velocity here. So which one of these formulas do you use? Well, when you're first learning how to deal with air resistance using calculus, you often use this nice formula because otherwise you might get lost in the math and forget all about the physics. Once you deal with this and you're doing well, then you can move over to the more exact formula because the math's gonna be a little harder, but hopefully you've got your sea legs by then and you're okay with dealing with calculus that's a little more complicated due to this square value. And the fact that you'll have to add the negative sign by hand to get the direction to come out correctly. So recapping, the drag force on an object is gonna be proportional to the density of the fluid through which that object moves. It's also proportional to the cross-sectional area of that object. It's gonna depend on the drag coefficient, which is determined by the surface texture of the object interacting with the fluid, as well as the contour of the actual shape of that object. And it's proportional to the speed squared of the object moving through that fluid. However, if you're moving at slower speeds and there's basically no turbulence, a nice approximate formula for the drag force is that it's negative B, a constant, which just depends on all these factors like shape and form and texture, multiplied by just the velocity, not the velocity squared. If you want an easy, doable approximation to the drag force at slow speeds, you use this one. If you want a more exact value for what the drag force is that's a little harder to calculate, you'd use this one.